Hey, hey everybody, how are you doing? This is Brian Kramer. We're back for another H to H chat. Really excited to be here uh, with a few guests that I've been friends with for a little while. And I'm looking forward to talking about their newest book, The Fourth Transformation. Um, we've got Robert Scoble and Shell Israel. How are you guys doing today? Doing just great. Good to be here, Brian. I'm doing great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you guys are um, you guys are on working on your is this your eighth book? Well, it's, it's, book. it's my seventh book and my third book with Robert Scoble, um, which are always the best received of the books I do. See that? So there is something to, to you two as a team, and um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But first and foremost, I want to make a proper introduction. Shell and Robert have been researching, writing, and speaking about techno technology's impact on the near-term future together and separately since 2005. They're best known for two critically acclaimed best-selling tech books, Naked Conversations, um, I don't think that that you're naked when you have a conversation all the time, but it sounds like a good good book to, to that you must read. Which is it was yes. Robert is prone to take shower shots, which would explain the title. It's true. It's true. And now he has virtual reality for that for those naked shots. And, oh my um, god! I thought that was the amazing Ant Man over there. Oh, you're talking <laughs> about how great we are. I'll be quiet. We are having some fun already, which is. Um, basically, the, one of the best, uh, the two best-selling books, Naked Conversations, which cr is credited with explaining the business opportunities in social media, and then The Age of Context, that explained how the convergence of mobile, social media, IoT, data, and location technologies, say, so you can rest medicine, would forever, forever change the relationships between business, customers, and stakeholders. So we are going to be talking today about their fourth book, uh, the fourth transformation. Um, Shell, why don't you tell us what what got you uh, excited about writing about this topic as the next topic for a book with uh, Robert? It always starts with Scoble. Um, I stay home and knit and hang out and play Scrabulous on the computer. And he goes all over the world talking to people, showing up at conferences. In fact, he seems to have access to the most forward-thinking technologists and business people in the community we cover. Um, every few years, he comes to me and says, Shell, I got a great idea. There's something going on. It's going to change the world, and it's really terrific. And I go, no, it isn't. And he goes, yes, it is. It's wonderful, and you'll love it. And we get into a process where twice previously and now three times, he's convinced me that technology is about to happen that will change the world. The first time we were ballsy enough to say that social media would have an impact on how business worked. And everybody thought it was for lonely teenagers uh, talking about lunch, so they didn't pay attention. The second book, Age of Context, was Robert again seeing five, uh, five uh, technology trends, uh, data location, um, social media. Um, Robert, help me with the other two, if you can recall. Um, yeah. Tell me. <laughs> well, there were five of them back then, but we, we're getting older. We don't remember so well. And now. Oh, pillars from Naked Conversation, from uh, Age of context. context. Yeah. Um, it was wearables. Uh, social media, sensors. Yeah. Um, you did it. You named the two I was missing, wearables yeah. and sensors. And now there's this new book, which is really, uh, to quote, uh, quote the 60s, altered perceptions of reality. Um, this is also the point where over the next few years, we move from people that are not quite standing upright like this to standing upright like this and having everything happening closer to our brain, closer to our eyes, which is the fastest moving part of our bodies. It changes, and I'm the one that's not prone to exaggeration, but what is coming changes everything. You, before we started, started talking about your children's behavior. Now, I don't think they're going to end up obsessed in this lonely, addictive world of VR, but I think it's going to change how they work, how they live, how they shop, how they communicate, just about every other, their health. 
and so on. And Robert, how about yourself? What was the uh, what was the 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 moment then you, that you uh, you knew this is the book this that you got to get into this you got to do this and talk about this and and mm. and and what the heck are you wearing? I'm wearing a Microsoft Hololens because this is part of the book. Uh, this is a mixed reality glass. It puts virtual things on my walls and around me. Uh, we call them holograms, but it also puts uh, uh, stuff on the walls, which is uh, really mind-blowing, actually. Um, I don't know if there was one time when we totally figured out this book. I, there wasn't one event that hit me, uh, you know, and, and convinced me that, that this was it. I, the interviews for this book started in 2011 when I interviewed the C CTO of um, Mattio, but back then I had no clue I'd be doing a book on augmented reality. It was just me doing what I do, going around the world and talking to people who are building the future. And, you know, uh, over the last few years, it became obvious that mixed reality and augmented reality were, were becoming much more important and were about to become really important to the world. So, um, so let's, let's start talking about the, um, the, the transformation. Um, there's, there's a, there's a bunch of different items here that, that, that fit into the transformation. Yeah. Um, uh, the augmented reality, virtual reality, chatbots, um, well, artificial intelligence. For, for me, for me, the transformation was where when we finally realized that we're getting a new user interface, and whenever a user interface has changed, uh, and, and this is the fourth real user interface of my life, of the personal computing age, um, you know, because we started out with character mode on the Apple II and, and the, and the uh, PC, then we went to GUIs on the Macintosh and Windows, then we went to touch computing on smartphones, and now we're getting a user interface that's laid on top of the real world. And VR, to me, is a precursor of this change. It almost uh, predicts this change. Um, in, in three years, I'm convinced that many of us are going to be wearing glasses and computing, on, on, like with this HoloLens product, uh, all all around us. Right. So um, you you broke your broke your book down into two parts. Ex and Shell, can you explain the two uh, sections? I thought there were three. <laughs> uh, three parts. Sorry, you're right. <laughs> You would know. Well, yeah, but I, let me grab my table of contents so I don't watch it. Yeah, you got uh, it. Yeah, did my shoulder look good on the uh, stage there? Okay. Where is that TOC? I know I put it in here somewhere. Here we go. Okay, the first section were, were game changers, and that's actually – where we did the most writing, and that basically talked about things like HoloLens and uh, Meta and um, Magic Leap and the technology that's happening and how it's changing, how people are communicating, how business is going to happen, how marketing is going to change, how humans and business will interact. I said humans, Brian. Well, you did. You did say yes. humans. You weren't listening. I'm slacking on my job. Okay. The second section was business changers, and um, that looked at brands such as Lowe's, such as uh, ooh, um, um, the medical industry, uh, where we've seen more change coming down the line in VR, AR than in the last 10 years combined. We looked at retail, we looked at enterprise, and we told business thinkers how other businesses are already using this technology. The third part was World Changes, which had only two t paragraphs, uh, two, two chapters in it. One was the dark side, which was the longest chapter in the whole book. And the last one was the incredible happy ending in which the world moves into the era of spatial computing. So now there's no mystery to it. You know how it ends. <laughs> so Robert, what, what is going to change? What, 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 what changes are we, can we expect? Well, first of all, uh, to get into this new world, you're going to have to put something on your face, uh, a pair of glasses. I mean, you know, 
we have the snap spectacles, which aren't yet augmented reality, but they will be, uh, all the way up to the HoloLens uh, style thing. Today, they're too big and too dorky for consumers. That's why Microsoft hasn't made a big consumer push yet, because this is simply too heavy to wear most of the day. Um, in two or three years, that, that problem is going to be fixed, and the, op and the uh, viewing angle is going to be fixed. So we should back up, because uh, mixed reality is five new technologies on a pair of glass. W the most important one is the optics that put virtual stuff on top of the real world. So when you look through the glass, you see uh, a whale coming out of the uh, out of the floor, right, or something like that. It, it, in HoloLens, I have virtual screens in front of me when I'm working, and then I can play games where stuff is on all the walls. It senses where the walls are, and that's the second uh, technology. We're putting 3D sensors now on these devices, including on our phones. Uh, Lenovo has a phone with a Tango sensor that when you walk into a mall, it shows you uh, where products are in the mall, and it, sh it knows where you are at a very, uh, very, very close uh, uh, detail. Um, we're also going to get art artificial intelligence, so it's going to know that you're looking at a table or a glass or a wall or a, a floor or a camera or a human, right? Hey, there's another human. <laughs> And um, we're we're um, getting new kinds of wireless in the in the new um, in the next three to four years. Uh, L five G is coming out in twenty nineteen, according to Qualcomm. Um, and what else? There's a few other things. We are getting eye sensors that watch your eyes move around. So the new user interface that's coming along inside these glasses are going to be controlled by your hands, by your voice, and by your eyes. Uh, and your motion as well, and and uh, that'll expand. And we have a whole chapter on that. And and we interviewed um, iFluence, which uh, Google bought. And there's a few other things too. Audio is a big part of this, um, and we're seeing a revolution happening in in audio. <laughs> what about and, smell? Uh, I don't know. So um, you know, all of this stuff is coming um, soon. And, and the next iPhone is going to do augmented reality. Tim Cook has already started preparing the market by talking about it a lot um, and sort of signaling that a major new product is coming. But he's ha hardly alone. I know of nine companies that are building glasses, and I'm sure there's a few that I don't even know about yet. Let, let's talk about what's possible. What not just what what's here today, but what's going to be possible. Because I was talking to um, uh, Courtney, my wife and business partner, who you guys both know. Your um, better and, and half. My better half, way better half. And and we were talking about um, about actually, you know, would it be possible to be inside of a movie and interact yes. with and interact with the characters and actually have um, an experience unlike going to a movie theater. Yes. And just sitting and being one way direction. That's one of, I'll go. I'll go. Me, me. All right. Um, we we have an entire chapter on how. Uh, first of all, what you're talking about when you say a movie is storytelling. We've been telling stories since somebody started smearing blood and berries on a cave wall. Uh, we have stories that are our national histories. Um, uh, our religions and stories are really what will drive, have driven everything going forward. The difference is for theater, movies, television, we've always sat on one side of a screen and the story is unfolded uh, behind the screen and we're just passive. Now we become immersed in the stories. Uh, there's Penrose is one of several companies that um, is a studio that's making immersive uh, virtual reality movies where the characters in the movie are followed around or just watched or looked over the shoulders by attendees uh, of theater and movies. Uh, he does, uh, he's got one, the one an award at Sundance called Alamette. Alamed is the little match girl modernized. And it gives you the feeling that you're watching this story with these really adorable little uh, virtual characters walking around inside a dollhouse 
And you can go from one window to another and see the story differently. Whenever I think of how stories are going to be told, I think of the Nobel laureate, uh, Robert Dillon, <clears throat> who uh, said, I'll let you be in my story if I can be in yours. And that's how stories are going to be told moving forward. You mean the uh, Bobby Zimmerman? But, no, his name was never Zimmerman. If you read volume one of his three-part memoir, you'd know that. <laughs> that was according, to, according to a friend that I went to school with him, that's what his name was in high school. <laughs> well, all I know is what Bobby told me for 1995. <laughs> we already uh, are getting uh, experiences like this, Brian. Uh, on HoloLens, there's a game called, or not really a game, an experience called Fragments. And you map out, so you, you know, you you, you uh, take your HoloLens and it asks you to map out your your room, and then it puts a murder right in your room, and you have to solve the murder. And there's rats running on the floors, and there's stuff on all the walls, and it's matched to where to your real room, right? So the the stuff is on your walls. And there's another uh, another uh, experience where aliens dig dig through your walls, blow holes in them. And it looks like a hole. You walk around and you see through your wall now. <laughs> and, and aliens come through the wall and you have to shoot them, you know, with your finger. And um, that's I, would like, I would like to point out that this is, we've only had the book out now 10 days. We did an Australian tour. And every time we do an interview or a presentation, it varies greatly. But Robert always manages to get those damn virtual rats into every presentation. Hey, they're, He's they're, got this thing with cool. the ratings, you know. <laughs> Makes the girls scream. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's entertaining. <laughs> so, so you open the book up with um, chapter one, what Zuck saw. Did he, ch did he start the movement? No. Um, First of all, we open the book up with an introduction that says, in the beginning, there were mainframes, and the biblical references intended. And then we go through four, um, four trans uh, transformations that Robert listed earlier. What Zuck did in March of 2008, 2016, was on slide 22 at F8, his developers conference, he showed a pair of glasses that are not uh, not unlike the ones you're wearing right there. And this was at a time when we were seeing this goofy or tethered big stuff being sold for high prices and people like Scoble flipping out at how wonderful this stuff is. <coughs> Try to stay awake, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> and Zuck basically said he had a vision for one day, people will walk around with something that looks like what I'm wearing as well as you, and it will contain everything you need, and will have virtual reality and an augmented reality, what's starting to be called mixed reality. And whether there's something the size of a, a cell phone that you have in your pocket that has a GPU, a CPU, we don't know. But what he saw was a device that everyday people could wear in any situation and feel comfortable in it and have the advantages of AR and VR in very, very simple, fashionable, uh, affordable fashion. And that's why we led with that, because what we were trying to do is all this goofy and freaky stuff right now is the beginning of a very rapid evolution. We're just barely climbing out, of, crawling out of the slime um, in the evolutionary swamp but we will soon be walking upright wearing devices such as you're moving around the screen rather than showing my face. Uh, and so that's why we started with uh, what Zuck saw. Yeah, this is a, a picture from a Qualcomm presentation last week and it's very similar uh, to what yes. uh, Zuck showed off in his slide deck. And uh, you can see what the industry is now saying is going to be on these kinds of glasses, tracking cameras, uh, eye tracking cameras, optics, you know, uh, new kinds of microphones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and these are coming. Um, it's just when, when are they coming, you know? And so 
Um, there's a, uh, you, you mentioned the word freaky. I know you talked about freaky in your last book, um, but, but this takes freaky to a whole new level. In fact, the way that Robert, you were just describing that experience, it's almost like an acid trip, but um, uh, even Courtney just tweeted, but it's an acid trip you can get off anytime you want. Um, <laughs> it was a great quote on, on Twitter just now. What, what, what is the, there is a freaky line that, that, that goes, goes pretty far here because we, we put this thing on our face and cross over into another land where we start losing real human connection. Would you agree or disagree and why? I, I'll disagree, but um, we're getting stuff where you're going to look through the glass to uh, people and you're going to see uh, stuff that's augmented. And, it, and it's really hard to explain this without showing what it does currently, which isn't all that high a resolution, but it's good enough to fool your eye into into your mind into thinking robots or uh, aliens are coming through the wall if you're playing that kind of game. Sephora that we visited is already putting augmented makeup on people with an iPhone. So you don't even need a 3D sensor to do this. Anybody who's on Snapchat knows that you can put cats or, or masks on top of your face uh, with Snapchat. That is augmented reality. That's changing your reality to make you more interesting on Snapchat. And uh, Facebook has something similar um, uh, on, on, on their platform coming. S Sephora is already making it so that you can try on augmented makeup on your face. And soon I'm going to walk up to you and see that makeup on your face um, with these glasses on. And that's And that's where we're heading to. Does that increase the human connection or decrease it? Well, I think it increases it, but. Yeah, you said that word. Um, <clears throat> going back to Zuck, he said at the same conference that VR is the most social technology he's ever seen, which is interesting for the leading social network that isn't using VR. Um, in the book, we have next week, this week, uh, in two days, we're doing a uh, <clears throat> the first ever book present book launch party at, at Altspace uh, VR in, in Redwood City, uh, where we'll be talking with people all over the world about um, our book, um, and they'll be able to talk to us and see our avatars. Um, you know, it, it, it's. And J.S. Gilbert just tweeted out a link to that for everybody who's, who's watching. So make Thank sure you, you go JS. sign up for that. Thank you, J.S. We were being uncommercial, but we'll take it from you. Um, in the book, we talk about countless cases, but at TED uh, in, Jan in, I think it was January of 2016, two companies came out with their first products ever um, in this category. One was Meta, the Meta 2 and uh, the HoloLens came out from Microsoft. Both cases, they showed a conversation between people that were remotely located from each other uh, who could see each other in the same room in their real life forms or something close to it, who could fist bump, hug, and shake hands and actually feel it with haptic technology. This is, you know, picture what we're doing right here, right now would be like with the advantage of in this case, an augmented reality platform, so you could actually see us. But we would feel like we're in one room together. We would see objects together um, that are really, while we're really located many, many miles apart. I think this is the most social thing I've ever seen, and I think it takes what we wrote about in our first book and, and puts it on stero steroids way beyond what we pictured when we were talking about tweeting and blogging. So, so we're, you um, in the third uh, section, you talk about what could possibly go wrong. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, you have no idea. Um, Robert, you go first on this one. Um, governments could use it to control you. <laughs> Privacy could uh, be further infringed. We're wearing a 3D sensor that is so detailed it can see your heart uh, beating three feet away. It can see how hard I'm touching a table from three feet away. It can see uh, the fabric in your in your shirt so it can know what, what brand shirt you're wearing uh, and on and on. 
Um, you know, uh, Pokemon, which is not not full blown augmented reality, but it gives you a, a sense of where things are going, gets a thousand people to run across a park to collect a new Pokemon. So it, it, that's with a phone in your hand. You know what? What when you what happens when you wear glasses and it can make the whole world around you different than the real the real world? The, there's a lot of um, risks here. Yeah. In, in fact, what we the way we conclude that chapter is we don't know how humans will change as animals over time. We were faster on the trigger that time and. Um, distracting as well. We don't really understand the long-term effects on, uh, on social interaction between people. Um, we didn't know what the changes would be when social media came along. We didn't know what the changes would would be when we move from the desktop to this thing. And not only could everyone use digital technology, we could use it everywhere. Now we are getting technology so close that the barrier of the screen is disappearing. Now we are uh, being able to filter out anything that is unpleasant or ugliness in our life. And is this a good thing? If every time you see a homeless person, can you turn that person into a flower pot? Well, technically you could. But should you? Should you become unaware of that which is unpleasant? Um, you, you just... There's a line from uh, Edward Albee in one of my favorite plays of the 60s, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, where she looks at him and says, truth and illusion, George, you don't know the difference. And he answers, oh, yeah, well, that's why I stick with you, baby. And is that the kind of relationships we want to have moving forward? So let's jump into the the positive side, the, the, light, the lighter side. Um, there, there's a point in, in the book, too, where you talk about education and uh -huh. how, how avatars for role models uh, it could become teachers of our kids and, 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 and be able to help people pretty much limitless around the world. How can that work? Want me to go, Robert? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I can think of no educational experience that could be, in, is not being improved by uh, what's coming down the line. Case Western is teaching anatomy to future surgeons by instead of having them cut open cadavers, which of course is the reason we three didn't go to med school, um, you now do it with virtual reality. Instead of looking at dead organs, you look at live organs. You understand the pancreas's relationship to, to the kidney. Somebody else on the East Coast has an open heart tour. His daughter has a congenital heart defect, and it motivated him to, to use te uh, technology to allow doctors to tour a human heart and look at a model of a patient's heart and see where the flaws are and the problems are. In history, instead of knowing that the Battle of Hastings <clears throat> was fought in 1086, you can actually go there and see the battle and understand the blood and gore of when they used broad axes and swords to settle issues. Um, you can take tours of the White House and Buckingham Palace. In China, where they have this enormous problem, which is as well as they're doing in controlling the expansion of their population, they're still getting more grammar school children than they can produce teachers. So the teacher um, student ratio keeps getting worse as time goes on. And China is hell bent to be the world leader in education. So they're starting to play with uh, virtual teachers where students will wear glasses and they will customize their teachers. Somebody could like a young female instructor. I'm sure Robert would. Um, others would like an old white haired uh, instructor. And in so doing, they have somebody that they will pay attention to. This virtual instructor will see when the student gets bored and give them pop quizzes. Um, so they're looking, and, and oh yeah, they're using uh, one, a net dragon, which is one of the leading slash and ha slash and hack uh, game uh, companies in China. They're using them to produce this new virtual instruction. So. Everywhere you look, whether you want adult training, uh, learning how to fly a jet plane, 
whatever you think of, it is better in virtual reality. Oil rigs, they're teaching um, workers, field workers, how to respond to an emergency in an oil rig before they ever leave land. Uh, it's everywhere. And it's this is why the enterprise is surprisingly way ahead of consumers at this point, although we're not sure that's going to last much longer. Okay, I want to ask a um, uh, uh, question here for Robert. Um, before we jump into questions, I'm getting lots and lots of questions, so we're going to turn over to the questions here just in one second. If you have more questions, feel free to put them out on hashtag H2H chat and just go ahead and ask your question there. I'll try to fit it in. Uh, we're going to start that in just a second. Um, before I do that, um, Robert, there's, there's a... Um, there's, there's a lot of technology, a, a lot of different headsets and a lot of different uh, spectacles and, and, and different um, uh, augmented reality producers and creators. Um, yeah. Will, will and, we find- And will, VR. And VR. So are we, are we going to find some semblance of, you know, kind of like Wi-Fi, like there's a standard to Wi-Fi that we all operate on so that we can, you know, we can, we can, we can jump onto Wi-Fi. Is there gonna be a standard for any of this technology? Or is there everyone going to winners? There will be winners eventually, and that will define the standard, right? Um, we're building a new 3D map of the world, and in fact, we're building several 3D maps of the world. Uh, Uber's building one, Google's building one, uh, Apple's building one, Facebook's building one, and and on. And there's there's many others. And these 3D maps of the world are going to run our robots, our drones, our self-driving cars, and these new mixed reality glasses. And we should have a standard, but that's not how the tech industry works. These, these companies are not talking to each other. They're competing with each other. They're trying to innovate and come up with something new. And so um, until we see it, you know, demoed by Apple and Facebook and Amazon, we're not going to see these companies get together at standards bodies and decide on a uh, a way to share 3D maps of the world uh, with each other. That's a competitive advantage right now, and and the innovation is happening so fast that I I just don't see that happening anytime soon. I might be wrong, but uh, there are certainly are groups of companies getting together, but it's mostly for marketing concerns, not for how do we join our voxel maps. In other words, volumetric pixel maps together with everybody else in the world that, that just that kind of discussion is not happening and the same thing is happening with optics you know Carl Zeiss is working with Apple on theirs and ODG is working with Facebook on theirs and and you know nine other groups around the world are working on optics I mean I you know um, and, and I don't see those companies getting together and deciding on a standard either so I I don't see a standard coming out of this anytime soon. Um, it, I might be wrong, but I, I'm not hopeful there. I, I, I see us again in this early crawling out of the slime of the uh, evolutionary swamp period. In the past three transformations, hardware began the process of a transformation and culminated after we passed over a chasm and people and their relationship to digital technology changed. We're still in the, the new hardware phase and that will shake out over time just like the auto industry once had I think scores of <clears throat> car manufacturers then three and then it changed again as it went global. Right now the hardware needs a great deal of refinement. The price needs to come down. It needs to be untethered. It needs to have a whole lot of things resolved. <clears throat> and when it does, then I think there may be standardization. Um, the differences between Android and Apple phones are still there, but they're less so than they were 10 years ago when the iPhone came out and was the first device that used software for keys rather than little tiny keys and a tiny little um, on screen. So we need to hit a point where what we wear really doesn't matter so much as what we can do in terms of software and communications. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into the questions here 
And uh, as your questions come in, I will grab them. So go ahead and keep them coming. Uh, coming. Um, Jason Martin said, I get the entertainment value of AR, but that what consumer pain point can be solved by marketers with AR? Give a universal example, uh, please. Well, um, everything is going to change because you're going to wear these things all day long. And you're going to walk in a shopping mall and you're going to say, hey, Siri, where's the blue jeans? And for blue jeans, virtual blue jeans are going to pop up in the air. And you're going to say, yeah, I want the 501, uh, you know, uh, uh, Levi's. To whom should I send your message? <laughs> in fact, Siri is listening. <laughs> and 501, uh, 501, you know, you're going to click that uh, jeans with your finger. And then a blue line is going to appear on the floor taking you right to those jeans in the mall and this is already being worked on uh, we visited the R&D labs you know they already know where every product is in the, in the Valley Fair mall in, in the uh, Westfield malls right and and the guys who are running the R&D labs at Westfield are working full-time right now on mixed reality same thing when you walk into a lobby of a hotel same thing when you see a new car or want to buy a new car same thing when you go to a sporting event you're gonna see stats on top of the players as they're running down the field with these cars. So everything is going to change about the world that you're walking around in. And then at work, you're going to have multiple screens now, and, and you're going to be able to code in new ways or design things in new ways. I mean, if you play in VR, you can already play with Google Tilt Brush and see just how much how different that is from painting on on physical media, you can draw a line that sticks in the air. You know, you can't do that on physical media. And the line can pulse uh, in reaction to sound in the room, right? And, and or do other stuff. So you can create new things that are impossible to create on physical media and it's cheaper, right? We, we visit Disney, uh, I talked to the head of ride design at Disneyland and he said, we already use VR to design the new theme park that opened in Shanghai this year, right? And Ford has a whole room for designing cars in VR in, in its R&D lab in Silicon Valley. So we're going to work together on 3D objects, on, on buildings, on, on anything that's made, right? I mean, even something simple like this is made in 3D uh, in a CAD program, then sent to a manufacturing line, right? And so we can design new things together this way in, in a way that just was not possible with other with you know 2D screens. Marketing as we know it is a thing of the past. Robert mentioned the <clears throat> mapping of objects in the uh, malls. This exists. A company call, called IL411 has a <clears throat> partnership with what was called Google Tango and is now just Tango. Um, so that you can go and say blue jeans and you can go today and find out which one is right for you. The marketing comes in that your, uh, the artificial intelligence will know who your favorite celebrities are, whether it's a football star or an actress, and that celebrity can talk to you and walk to you and show you the jeans they prefer. Um, there are studios popping up in near Hollywood or on the west, west end of Los Angeles <clears throat> and all over the country where creative people are creating VR marketing programs for forward-thinking brands. McDonald's showed off a forward-thinking <clears throat> tilt brush is a way of painting in midair. And they use tilt brush to let kids paint spray paint butterflies while they're waiting for their Big Macs to arrive, which is an entirely new way of doing it. A company called Blipper will now let you buy when your your phone sees a logo you like. If somebody's walking down the street and they have a Nike swoosh on their um, sneakers, you can focus on the sneakers and touch the screen and buy. And because your phone knows you, it'll use the right credit card and deliver it to your correct address. And this is just year one. This is just where the pioneers are. Lowe's is letting you use um, augmented reality to redesign your kitchen. They've created a virtual holodeck in selected stores where you can decide whether you want the granite uh, counters uh, precisely to the scale of your own kitchen or you want the uh, st stainless steel counters instead. 
Everywhere we looked, we saw marketing opportunities and in our dark side, our, what I thought was the scariest thing um, was what happens when all marketers everywhere have the access to do all of this at once. There's, I'm forgetting his name, it's a Japanese name uh, designer, Robert, you might remember, who has a series of uh, dystopian um, um, visions of the future where wherever you go, whatever you do, uh, sounds and visions and screens are popping up in front of your face. So if you want to make tea, uh, suddenly a voice that sounds very much like Siri is telling you, first you must heat the water. Now when you see steam coming out of the kettle, be careful not to touch the steam. And every object that you're going to use, how to flush the toilet, how to turn on the sink, could have this. And the, the thing about marketing is it ignores Isaac, it confirms Isaac Newton's belief that once something is in motion, it will continue in motion until you stop. And I really hope we have a way of pushing a stop button that filters out excessive marketing moving forward. You guys, there's um, a conversation going on on Twitter right now between Chris Voss and Ian Gertler and, uh, and Courtney. As you guys know, Courtney uh, just wrote a book, uh, 21 Reasons Why Creativity is Like Sex. And or Ian and um, Chris are talking about uh, uh, that genre and even went to the specific example of Tinder. Um, and and now now we've got virtual reality. So I'm going to take the conversation there and um, and say how um, and ask you guys how how is this going to play out in the in the single space in the dating space and maybe even into the um, you know the porn industry. I mean there this is a the, the, that that's what drove technology to begin with. The web grew based upon that technology. Are we going to see that again? see yourself yes. again I, I, are we seeing what again sorry are we going to see that again are we going to see uh technology uh, uh being driven by uh things like the porn industry or using virtual reality i mean that, that that's what happened the with porn the industry web first certainly is important and it certainly is a driver to, for for some people to get new technologies i mean it always has i sold you know many a vcr back in the 1980s in my consumer electronic store um uh, to people who wanted that, right? And the same is true today. But I, I don't think the, the adult industry really is pushing the tech, technology industry. I'm not, I mean, not, none of the stuff that's that I'm seeing for, on Hollands is adult. So, um, and last year at CES, where it exploded, the adult industry wasn't part of it. What is true, Brian, is there's not just the visual that everybody's <clears throat> talking about. This haptic technology that lets you feel things. Robert, when he visited uh, <clears throat> a virtual reality amusement park, felt a saw Ghostbusters and felt the whoosh as a ghost went through his body. Wow. Um, we've seen people do fist bumps on stages when one of the fists is a thousand miles away from the other, and they wow. feel the collision. So, what you could do with with, with sex is clearly there. Um, I asked uh, the founder of Meta <clears throat> if a, teen a shy teenager could get a virtual girlfriend and end up having sex with her and end up preferring the virtual girlfriend to a real one. And he thought for about 10 <laughs> seconds and said, yep. And that kind of ended the conversation. I didn't have a follow-up that went beyond that <laughs> and whether this is something good as a tool of therapy as a tool of entertainment or a tool of self-satisfaction remains to be seen it's it's going to be uh it's going to be interesting to see uh, uh how that that plays out i'm sure and chris voss is probably the most excited by it um so yeah, but, yeah but for courtney it could sell a lot of books it really could um so uh, let's see. So, uh, Spicotti on uh, Twitter just asked, um, "How do how do you get? Um, at what point will they become more affordable um, for uh, for learning, memory, physical, sensory enhancement, uh, disabilities, neurodiversity, things like that?" That's a lot of questions there. Um, 
first yeah. of all, affordable depends what you mean. Um, for me, it's going to uh, sell tens of millions of uh, uh, phones next year, right? The next iPhone is going to do full-on next-generation augmented reality with a 3D sensor that 600 engineers in Tel Aviv are working on right now. And uh, that will be a standard iPhone price. So if you can afford an iPhone, you're going to get virtual reality and augmented reality by the end of 2017 included in your iPhone. So if that's affordable to you, we're, we're in, in 2017. If you're talking about a kid in Mumbai and a slum in Mumbai, they can only afford a $200 phone or less, right? Yeah. And they already have phones that are in that price category, but these phones are going to be a few years before they get to that level, maybe three, maybe five years before they come down to the $200, $300 a phone level. Um, and that's when we are going to see them really go mainstream. Uh, you know, Shell and I argue about timing all the time. When I say we we are getting this next year, that's what I exactly what I mean. The normal uh, high end tech enthusiast is going to get them. Robert, I take issue with you right there. I have never classified you as normal, and I never will. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you're, tens of millions of people are going to get it in 2017, if that's what you mean. Yeah. If you're if you're talking about when is the kid in Mumbai going to get it, yeah, we're going to uh, probably five years, maybe uh, five to ten years, somewhere in that range. And, yeah. and guys, what, um, Nancy Rubin said, what about things like uh, other peripherals, like contact lenses? Um, how will that will that uh, be possible with virtual way, or augmented? That's way out into the future. Um, again, we're just crawling out of the swamp. I want you to go back to the previous question, though. Moore's law is still in play. Um, the more adoption there is, the more powerful, uh, useful, and less expensive objects become. Uh, Moore's law seems to be accelerating right now when it comes to adoption to VR and AR devices and will continue to accelerate for a while. I have very little to disagree with Robert on technology. In fact, I wouldn't publicly dare to disagree with him on technology. I think what is going to slow it down a bit is human resistance to this. Um, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> you got me. Uh, I've said people three times to avoid that, but uh, anyway, it, it, it's for my generation. I'm. I'm. I know I'm still dashing and handsome, but I am 72, and most of my friends left me when the center of my world became Facebook. Uh, they have not come back. They don't like this, and they sit around and say, "In my day, we just smoked dope and dropped acid and saw all these things you're talking about in these new times." I look to the future and I see the millennials, which we talk about a whole lot, and, an, and the generation that comes after them, the second generation of digital natives, we call them Minecrafters for some obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I look to them to be the rapid adopters that will transform the world. Ten years, I, in the book we talk about ten years, since then Robert has said, feels that's too far out. But 10 years from now, the first millennials are going to start becoming grandparents. Aging boomers will have, for the most part, wandered off into the twilight and the sunset. And if we're not yet food for worms, we soon will be. And a new generation will be taking our place. And the world will have an expectation that we'll be using glasses, that we will be doing stuff by moving our eyes around and by... 10 years out from now, brainwaves. Um, this is going to transform, the technology is going to be the horse in front of the uh, human social cultural car. And how fast that'll change, I don't know, but the price is not going to be the barrier. I waited this time until after you're done. I said it again. Oh, no. You did. Um, okay, so. Ewan, you, you, Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, so there's there's questions around. Um, it, we we need we haven't talked too much about artificial intelligence. It's kind of weaved in to the yeah. the conversation here. But but uh, there's a lot of questions coming in. Uh, like for instance, Nancy Rubin, uh, uh, I believe it's Nancy. Um, may have been someone else. I apologize. Uh, maybe oh, Jason Martin. Um, can VR w watch my kids on date night? And and um, and there's other questions on. Um, on, on artificial intelligence, like surrounding the the um, that movie Her, and how far are we away from that kind of interaction where it's actually helpful? It's not just Siri doing on command. You know, half the time it's wrong or sassy and just doesn't work. How far are we away from it actually working? Is your kid dating a robot by any chance? He might be. I yeah. don't know. I have to ask him now. Now you just made me feel. I got to figure out if he's doing it, that. It depends why. It, it, what you mean by not working? Because uh, with Siri, it has a lot of flaws. Some of which are going to get fixed in the next twelve months. The 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 huge flaw is you can ask it a question like how, how many people have been checked have checked in at the Half Moon Bay Ritz Carlton, right? And on Foursquare even. And there is an answer on Foursquare on that, uh, and there is an API, but it's not been hooked up to Siri. So Siri fails to bang and gives you a stupid answer because it's not hooked up. And w when you see the back end of Siri, there's 80 lines of code that Apple has to write to hook up, uh, you know, your utterance to an API call, and uh, that hasn't been done obviously, so it fails, and in the future, that's going to be fixed at some level uh, due to new artificial intelligence technology, but it's still not human. It's a long way from being uh, to where it can have a human-like conversation to you that hasn't been programmed. Now, if you have a bot, like like I saw, I, I visited Visa and, and uh, saw their prototype bot, they've anticipated the kinds of questions you would ask a bot that has to do with your credit card. And so if you ask one of those questions, it seems human. But if you ask it a question that's not been programmed, it fails again. And so it's not human, right? Humans can make up a good answer to something that's new, right? We come up, uh, you know, and, and computers are, are not all that good at doing that. I, I say we're building a new God where the God knows everything, but isn't very smart. <laughs> and for most humans, they can't tell the difference between knowing everything or being an all-knowing thing and smartness, intelligence. Uh, to them, it seems like the same thing. And in fact, they would have an argument that a good deal of intelligence is having access to the data uh, that runs your world, right? So if you ask it, hey, Siri, what, what nightclub should I go to tonight or right now? The the glasses could Let me check that. and there again Siri goes uh, Siri's listening right Hey uh, Siri <laughs> mute Robert's microphone <laughs> Yeah that doesn't work that way Damn it <laughs> It's not been hooked up um, But it could show you four pictures or five pictures of of uh, nightclubs It could show you the video coming off the nightclub and it could show you how many people are dancing because everybody's wearing these glasses on and, and therefore has sensors that are watching the world. And um, it could give you a, a quite good and accurate answer uh, on a whole lot of ways. And and that will look like some, some form of intelligence, but we're a long way from being really human-like uh, interactions on, on these kinds of search engines. There are there there all these little human characteristics that efforts have been made, but not a whole lot's happened yet. Empathy, common mm -hmm. sense. Um, yeah. It, it, it's the process of logic <laughs> is not necessarily the way humans work. Yeah. And I know the two of you off camera pretty well, and I know myself. And there are things that I can describe about all three of us that were far from logical that a robot would not do or say. <clears throat> and damn it, that, that's what we like about each other. That there's a great deal of talk about how all this is going to lead to a loss of jobs and a loss of humanness. Well, jobs is an issue that 
is real and we need realistic solutions to that. Robert's got some views on that. But the humanity, um, you know, I, I can hug a, a, a computer or I can, you know, theoretically in the near future, I can have a virtual lover. But why would I want one if I have a human? Why would I want something? Well, there is a, a short and, and banal answer to that. But overall, most of us really do want, please mute it for now, a human to human connection. I'm just going to give you guys one clap for all those humans. You just, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that you just shattered. Uh, uh, Jay Bear, I believe, was the was the most word uh, humans used in an HDH chat. And That's because he I'm wants gonna, to hug every human, and, and I don't. And I, I'm now claiming you guys the winner of the most said humans of any HDH chat in the last <laughs> two and a half years. That was epic. How many humans you guys just said? Do um, we, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do we? What get do you a win? Part? Do yeah, you win. Boxes? You win my uh, my my friendship for another week. Um, money so, money is far more appropriate, Brian. I know. I, know. <laughs> I I would I would do something about that, but I'm not going to. So um so the the, the let's escalate this in just the last four minutes. We uh, we've got four minutes to close this out, and this is going to uh, court uh, Courtney and um, and uh, Molly both brought up the topic of Westworld. And how Westworld is um, is kind of in line with what you were just saying about relationships with with uh, robots or with artificial intelligence. Now, obviously, we're not we're very very far away from Westworld. But the question is how um, how will how why can't we have a relationship with an, uh, soon with a artificially intelligent being? This is the first and only place I know where I'm ahead of Robert on technology. I'm up to episode three, and he hasn't started yet. And I love the series. I really do. It's a fantasy, and I would point out that people just go there for a vacation where they can either have sex or kill people. Um, and so far, it looks like they prefer killing to the sex part. Um, but what is interesting there is the evolution of the robots into sentient things that have feelings uh in the episode two the prostitute rubs her finger along her lips and that was not something she was programmed to do she was starting to assume the role and think that she really was a human feeling woman of the night um can this happen yes how long would it take many 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 years should it happen maybe it's the fact that i'm the old guy here but i hope not um robert's ready to boogie so take over i've tomorrow. already seen it i saw it at, at a, a conference a, a startup is creating an artificial human that you're going to talk to in uh augmented reality world um and it looks fairly compelling but it's not going to be very human-like at first. It's still going to be taught by artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is really good at telling the difference between a hus husky and a wolf or a stop sign and a stoplight. That's why it, uh, it works great on, on a self-driving car. Robert, and it'll be very good at telling that this is a coffee mug and there's a, ca a camera in front of me and there's a desk here. It's really good at that. It's not very good at understanding the empathy, how to be an empathetic human being. But we can have a lot of fun with a humanoid uh, assistant that follows you around <laughs> or, or interacts with you. Certainly, if you know the kinds of things you're going to be asking this kind of artificial thing um, uh, are limited, like at a McDonald's, you, you know, the McDonald's only knows that you're only going to ask about hamburgers or uh, chicken sandwiches or, or, or sodas. You're not going to ask it for your bank balance, right? You're not going to ask it about why your wife is mad at you today. <laughs> or, or okay. Not yet, but, you know, we can train an artificial human to do those kinds of things very, very efficiently. And then we'll get uh, uh, over the next, you know, a few decades, we'll get to uh, expanding its repertoire 
but it can be used for a lot of interesting things and and they are coming and they are pretty interesting uh, pretty interesting technologies that are uh, going to present these virtualized humans or virtualized robots even because it I believe at first you're going to uh, talk to something that doesn't look human to, to signal to you that it it isn't human and therefore you have to talk to it in a computer style interaction right so um, you guys are just uh, you guys are making me really happy here because in my book human to human I talk about uh, humans having uh, one competitive advantage and that is being uh, the most human you can in empathy imperfection and simplicity and um, and I do think that that those 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 pieces are going to carry on um, in 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 the near future, uh, you know, in, in the in the years to come. Um, I, I would like to point out that you just said human three times, and there was silence in the background. <clears throat> I just gave myself the clap. How's that? Okay, so um, <laughs> that's going to be in Courtney's book, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So, um, so you guys, we've just run out of time. I really appreciate you guys being on here today. We've, uh, we'll, uh, get some, get some links out about the books. I definitely recommend it uh, to everybody that's watching. Um, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, you guys, uh, congrats on an awesome, awesome book. Again, working together, you guys make a great team, um, as always. And, and, uh, really, really proud of you guys as my friends too. Um, thank and you. so you got it. You got it. And and I, I promised everybody I would announce who my co-host was going to be next year. Uh, gr glad Robert and Shell are, are here for me to um, uh, announce this to hear it. The new co-host for H2H Chat next year, which is going to have a slightly different title change. And it's going to be around creativity and humans and how humans will start to be the, in a new creative way um, using things like what we just talked about and what does creativity mean and so my new co-host is going to be Courtney Smith my wife and business partner and so she's going to be joining me on all the HTA chats uh, this next year so uh, welcome to Courtney and and finally thank you everybody because we trended number 28 on Twitter today uh, Shell and Robert that's much thanks to you guys um, we just trended nationally on 20 number 28 so congrats to you congrats to everybody out there uh, we will keep you up to date on the next H2H chat but otherwise we'll see you soon cheers everybody thank you I had a ball <laughs>